Well, welcome, everyone. I have my Bible in hand. I hope that you have your Bible, maybe even a sheet that has today's outline of the message. Please feel free. It's such a privilege always for me to bring the Word of the Lord and uh, in a very Christian nation. We want to talk about that a little bit. Wanted to bring somewhat of a little bit of a different message, but it is all about our happy Independence Day. Today is we have something that we celebrate together in common. It's our freedom that we have, and this freedom and this liberty that we have on this 4th of July, it really came at a great cost, did it not? It's tremendous when you start to take a look how that the signers of the Declaration of Independence often paid for the liberty we have with their own blood. It's important for us to recognize that five of them were arrested and executed for treason by Britain. Another nine of them really lost their life in battle during the Revolutionary War. And then we know that there are 12 of those signers that lost everything to Britain's fires. But we see that we actually are in a crisis as a nation. And today's message is entitled, Why America is Adrift. That is today's message. Why is it? Even though we know that this liberty is not cheap, we find that America seems to be hemorrhaging. Now, I don't want this to be a downer. I really want us to highlight some things and to see why maybe some of the cause, uh, why our American, uh, really, society as a whole seems to be deviating away from its original founders. And I think it's going to be important. I have three points that I just want to address. I think it's going to be important. But we recognize that we are facing all kinds of crises Crises in our budget, our nation, we are at $28 trillion deficit as a nation. That is tremendous. We remember back in 2001, we thought it was astronomical to be $3.5 trillion in debt. $3.5 trillion. Do you know how much $3.5 trillion at that time, how much that is? If you were to have started a business on the day that Jesus was born, and that business lost $1,000 a day. You wouldn't go through $3.5 trillion until the year 9,589. That's 7,400 years from now, just three, we're 28 trillion. We're in a crisis financially in our nation. We're also in a crisis when it comes to the educational system. Since really 1987, they're saying that we graduated over 700,000 students that can't even read their own diploma. And so we've spent probably more than any other nation into our educational system, and you can see the tension that's there. Our leadership in our nation, we're taking a look at our leadership. It seems like over these last few election cycles, there's a constant just throw the bum out. If somebody comes in, the other side wants to do everything they can to eliminate the leadership, trying to put a point of unity in our nation. We have a moral crisis. People are not quite sure what's right or wrong. It's kind of like everybody's doing their own thing. So what's happened to us? Where did we go wrong? And I've got just a couple of suggestions. You don't have to agree with me. That's the beauty of me getting to speak. I love that, don't you? It's like, here we go. We're going for it. You get to hear. But let's look at the first point, which is Christians neglected to pray for their government. Take a look at that for a moment. Christians neglected to pray. 60 plus years ago, we actually as Christians, I'm talking to Christians now and you who are watching, we went to sleep. We stopped praying for our society as a whole. We kind of went into an individualism. If you take a look at how much uh, Christian material is out there, it's all interest in our focus of our personal pursuits or how to accomplish or to acquire. But let's go back. We have stopped praying. We literally have just said, well, let's let the government handle the government issues, and let's let the churches handle the souls of men. Do you know who actually said that first? It was Hitler. He said, you Christians, go ahead and take care of the souls of men. I'll take care of the needs of the people. And when that kind of rolls out, then you start to direct things. But we're beginning to wake up. We really are. And I just, we're beginning to wake up to a nightmare, and that's what we're concerned about. But let's take a look here for a moment, because 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses really 1 through 4, therefore, New King James renders this, 
Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. When we take a look here, I just want letter A, our one of our subpoints, our quality of life depends on Christians praying. I want to highlight that. You and I have tremendous authority and great privilege as Christians. And to pray really constitutes the quality of life that we have. Let's just look at verses 1 and 2 just for a moment. It's just a reminder, therefore, the Apostle Paul writes, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority. Now, let's look at that just for a moment. This is important because Paul's saying, I exhort, I urge. And he says, first of all, this is what he's literally saying. It's as if a father were to take hold of their son, put his arm lovingly around his son, and say, listen, son, pay attention now. What I'm about to tell you is of utmost importance, and make sure this is first. And then he lists all four New Testament forms of prayer. He's listing very clearly how that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he highlights and he says, but above all for kings, those who are in authority. So we take a look. That's very important for us. So we want to infuse the idea that our obligations, our responsibility to our nation as a Christian nation is that we pray all these prayers, especially for those who are in leadership. The question being for me often, do you pray every day for your president? Do you pray every day for your senators, for your congressmen? We see what's going on in our state of California. Our own governor is going through a recall. People are trying to get rid of him. But the question is, do you pray every day? I've got to be honest, I don't, and it's wrong. We often have to consider praying for those who are in leadership and not just for what you would say would be the good guys. How about when if we were to pray, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, you pray even for your enemies, even for those who curse you and abuse you, persecute you. Why? Pray a blessing on them. Man, if they radically change like we have, look how changed you are. You all look so good today. Man, you got your Sunday best on and you got all your cleaned up and it's good. But when a person transforms their life for God, it can transform whole societies. But it's important for us, leadership. You might say, well, I, I need to be praying for my business and family. I, we get it, don't we? We do. But we must pray for those in leadership. Why? The obvious is it affects your business and your family. It will trickle down and come to rest in your doorstep. That's why we want to pray. And God says this is why you want to do that. Look at verse 2 again. When it says that we may lead, the point reference being on the screen, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So I would like to live in a peaceful and very quiet life. How many? Let's even take a vote. How many would like to live a quiet and peaceable kind of living? Put your hands up. Yeah, most of you, that's good. Some of you didn't raise your hand. You'll probably get what you want. You know what I mean? It's just, we have to be careful about that. And the reason we're still very, really, it's achieving victory after victory as a nation. You know why? You take a look at the Gulf War. You take a look at the Iraq War. You take a look at 9-11. You even look at how quickly we eradicated and came out from COVID. Reason being is that people said, man, we better, probably need to pray. We really need to pray, and that's important. How many remember 9-11? Some of you were still around during 9-11, and at that time, President Bush says, we need to get everyone in Congress in, the, in D.C. to pray, and they went to the cathedral in Washington, D.C., and how many remember the ancient sage, Billy Graham, came up to lead our nation in prayer? Wow. 
That's pretty awesome. Those are some great days, and God helped us in those tragic times. But America now, we seem to be hemorrhaging. How did we get to this place? Well, first of all, we forgot to pray. The chances of you or I being murdered today is 1 in 10,000 in, really in 2015. It was 1 in 20,000 in 1960. It's amazing that our chances of being murdered in America, the land of the free, is nine times higher than England now. What happened? It's amazing when we consider these things. I want a peaceful life. I want a really a wonderful environment. And it, what happened to us? We forgot to pray and intercede and giving of thanks for all men. Let's, as Christians, let's get back to it. Something about that. We know what God wants. He desires all men to come to the truth. Wow. That's a good place to pray. It's that the prophet once said that we basically, everybody doing their own thing, so we've sown to the wind, and now we're reaping a whirlwind. I'd like to see our nation get back. How about you? Second thing that I wanted to add, reason why, our first and foremost, we failure because we forgot to pray, is that our schools teach that the framers of the Constitution and the signers of the Declaration of Independence were deist and atheist. Now, I was told that in high school. I don't know if you felt that same way and were taught that. What is a deist? Well, a deist believes that God does exist, but once he created the world and everything around it, that he just backed off and he said, it's done, uh, I'm out of here, you're to yourself, you take care of things. And he just literally just feels that's no use to pray because God's not there anymore. It's a one and done. And an atheist, we understand that he just simply believes, they believe that God just doesn't exist at all. But it's interesting because 52 of the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence it's amazing because they were orthodox believers in Jesus Christ. It's so fun to start taking a look at their lives. They believed in God, and that really gave way to how they framed the Constitution. That's why they also, it was the founders of the Constitution, they also put together the American Bible Society. They developed that. Also, the American Tract Society and the Philadelphia Bible Society. They were absolutely convinced the rebirthing of a great nation must be a Christian nation. Glory to God. We've got a great legacy. How many remember Patrick Henry? Some of you might say, hoo hoo. Remember that guy who said, give me liberty or give me what? Yeah. You know, most of us know that, but we don't understand what framed that phrase. And here it is. Let me cite a few of these so that you can understand. We've been told a lie that our framers of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence were deists and atheists. Because nothing could be further from the truth. But Patrick Henry, in March the 21st, 1775, just before we entered into the American Revolutionary War, said this, we shall not fight alone. God presides over the destiny of nations. Does that sound like a deist to you? The battle is not to the strong alone. If life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the chains of slavery, forbid it, almighty God. Give me liberty or give me death. Now, we don't hear those other words. Somebody took that not only out of our school books, but out of history. They don't want you to hear those elements. They don't want you to understand that. Benjamin Franklin, most believe that Ben Franklin was a well-known deist of his day. But it's interesting to note that this is a speech that he gave during the Constitutional Convention, Thursday, June the 28th, 1778. He said, in the days of our contest with Britain, we were aware of danger. We had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Does that sound like a deist to you? Our prayers were heard and they were graciously answered. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I therefore beg leave. 
that we move henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings upon this deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed with businesses. Pretty amazing. Ben Franklin says, we can't do this alone. We constantly hear that in a small circle. Like, Let's, why don't we pray? I remember being in a business meeting and things were not going well. And somebody says, well, we, maybe we should pray. And the other guy on the cross the room says, dear Lord, has it come to that? Ha <laughs> ha, What? It's kind of like the aftermath. If we were so bad off, we should probably ask God. Benjamin Franklin says we should do it even before we begin business. We should do it even before you fire up your vehicle and drive off. God, my life's in your hands. Ben Franklin was ambassador to France, and he was trying to encourage France to basically take on our federal way of our constitution and the system. And he says, he who shall introduce into public affairs the principles of Christianity will change the face of the world. And that's literally what America has done. Have we not shaped? America is the greatest nation literally in history in its only 245 years of ex existence. Why is that? Because it was founded upon the scriptures, principles of the scriptures. I'm sure Ben Franklin would have rolled in his grave February the 6th, 1992, when Congress opened up with Muslim prayer to Allah. We'll take a look at how that has happened. America is really drifting. Let's take a look. George Washington said this in his personal diary. What a great guy. You should hear some of the life-saving things God did during the Indian, French and Indian War. Amazing, as a little upstart general, lieutenant. But back to George Washington, he said this and wrote it, let my heart, gracious God, be so effective with your glory and majesty that I may fulfill these weighty duties which you have required of me. I have called upon you to pardon me and forgive me of my sins. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on a cross for me. You gave your son to die for me and have given me the assurance of salvation. Glory to God. Man, does that sound like a born-again person? John Jay, the first chief justice and one of the three most famous drafters and framers of the Constitution, said this, and here we'll put that up for you. He said, Providence has given to choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as privilege, and in the interest of our Christian nation to be so elect and prefer Christians for their rulers. John Jay said that. It's important for us. They framed the Constitution around the Scriptures. That's, that's the beauty of being in America, and it's a beauty of honoring our day-to-day it, they had an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus. They said, if you're going to select your leaders, make sure they're Christians. It's worth noting that 11 of the 13 original colonies, before they framed the federal constitution, they each had their own constitution. Here's Delaware Constitution. Let's throw that up there for you. They're saying this, everyone appointed to public office must say, here it is, it's an oath, this is what they must say. I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, and God who is blessed forever. I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures and the Old and New Testament, which are given by divine inspiration. Most of our seminaries can't even say that today. <laughs> what happened that we are in such a, a disarray we take a look. First, we forgot to pray. Secondly, we've been told a lie that the framers of the Constitution were deists and atheists. Political science professors, many of them at the University of Houston, wanted to say, how is it that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights have lasted so long with very little modifications? And they did a research, it took 10 years and they came to this conclusion that they looked first at who the framers 
quoted most. So the framers quoted most often, first Montesquieu in his Spirit of the Law, Blackstone was another one, and John Locke. What they didn't anticipate in their findings, because they looked at 15,000 writings of the framers. Who were they quoting? Why were they quoting? That they found that the Bible was quoted four times more than Montesquieu, that the Bible was quoted six times more than John Locke, and that the Bible was quoted 12 times more than Blackstone. In other words, the fact was that 34% of their writings involved Christian basically Bible, Scripture, or application. There was literally another 60% of the quotes from the founders who were quoting somebody that those that they were quoting were quoting Bible passages. So these weren't deists and they weren't atheists. How did this document called our Constitution and the Bill of Rights stand over 245 years? I'll tell you, these were men people who were involved and they understood the word of God. They had an undying commitment to God and they were establishing a nation based on the principles of scripture. That is you and me. It's worth taking a look at and it's important for us. When they framed their laws, they based it on scripture. So here's a couple of them. How did they come up with the three branches of government? Here it was in Isaiah chapter 33 Verse 22, they saw in the scriptures, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king. He will save us. When they wanted co-equal powers in those three branches of government, they used Jeremiah 17. When they were fostering the elements of just really non-taxing of, really, when it came to Christian churches, when it came to churches, They use this passage in Ezra chapter 7, verse 24, and it says, Also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or customs on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, nethanims, or servants of this house of God. So you can see here how we bought a lie. First, we forgot to pray as Christians for our leaders. Secondly, we believe somehow that the founding fathers were deists and atheists. And let's look at the third and final one. We've been told that the lie that religion and government should never mix because the founding fathers established a wall of separation between church and state. That's a lie. They never did. Matter of fact, that term, separation of church and state, does not appear in the Constitution at all, or even the First Amendment, not there. It doesn't even appear until 1963 in the World Encyclopedia. So somewhere along the line, we were told that they wanted to not bring in church into the government efforts. Take a look at the phrase here. We have a point, the word separation of church and state for you via live stream does not appear in the Constitution or the First Amendment, and yet still 67% of Americans today believe it was a part of the Constitution. So let's just take a look, because that causes a lot of problems. The framers originally, the reason why they wanted to install this idea was that they did not want one Christian denomination to have and usurp authority over other Christian denominations. Like in England, the Church of England controlled the other Christian churches. So they wanted to make sure if there's going to be a separation that the one denomination of a Christian denomination would not rule over another Christian denomination. Remember the phrase, all men were created equal? That phrase really came out of fiery evangelistic preaching. There's a lot of quotes from those that are out there preaching circuits because the king of England felt he was exempt from Bible commands and directives. And they were saying, all men are created equal. O king, you need to adhere to the word of God. Patrick Henry said this. He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly, too often, that this great nation was founded not to be religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's important for us to recognize that. Founded upon Christians. John Quincy Adams 
said this, the highest glory of the American Revolution is this. Was it freedom? No. The highest form was it connected in one undissolvable bond, the principles of civil government and the principles of Christianity. So we've got to get this message back. Our country is based on Christian principles and on the word of God. It's powerful. Now, in the ruling of Holy Trinity versus United States in 19, or 1892, it's interesting because they said our laws and institutions must necessarily be based upon and embodied the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. <laughs> Guess who that is? That's Jesus they were referring to. The court went on to say it is impossible for to be otherwise, and in this sense, and to this extent, our civilization our institutions are practically Christian. So it's important when we take a look here, 87 different laws, presidents were declared based on that, according to godly Christian principles. Well, it's interesting. Did you know that the First Amendment, that freedom of expression and really religion, that in the early sets of our nation, they used tax payers money to fund missions and missionaries to go evangelize the Indians. That would never go today, but that's how it was. They spent tax dollars to educate students with distinctly Christian-based understanding. In 1782, Congress said this, the Congress of the United States approved and recommends to the people the Holy Bible for use in the schools. 18, 1782, I should say. Have you ever seen the New England Primer? It's a pretty cool book. It's a first grade book. Let me cite a couple of those. It's very important. This was used for literally 200 years, 16 to 1900, when a first grader was lose, using and lo <laughs> learning the ABCs. This is what it looked like. Let's put that up on the screen. It says the New England Primer, it says letter A. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is heaviness to his mother. Letter B, better is little with the fear of the Lord than abundance apart from him. Letter C, come unto Christ, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Letter D, do not do the abominable thing which I hate, saith the Lord. Letter E, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So why was America and some of the greatest and still is? Because we are founded on scriptures. Matter of fact, I just love when you take a look, and let me just lay out a couple more. I hope this is intriguing enough for you, and you realize, man, what a great nation. Our law school is interesting in the early startups. They literally used the textbook from Blackstone's commentary of the law. Every law student in the early start of our nation studied Blackstone. What he used was Bible scriptures and then the basis for his judgment. I'm calling this law because the scripture says. You can imagine how rich. And often it was cited that many of the law students converted to Christianity full on. And one of the most famous law students was Charles Finney. Charles Finney was called into the ministry by studying law from that book. And with that, over 500,000 people gave their lives to the Lord. Well, it's interesting. I just could go on and on where they list certain things. How did this all of a sudden start to unravel? Let's take a look. I just cite some of that, but it was in 1974, everything changed. First time that the Supreme Court basically ruled that the separation of church and state should separate everything. It wasn't the way the framers were. They just wanted to make sure one Christian denomination didn't usurp over another Christian denomination. A new approach was a new direction. In other words, Christian principles would not apply to the laws that would now be deliberated. In 1962, in Engel v. Vitell, the first cause dealing with religious principles that they removed prayer from the public school in 1962. 
This is the prayer. This is the prayer that children would pray every morning. Our dependence is upon thee. We beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. That was now unconstitutional to pray that. Supreme Court, without quoting a single reference or reason, said it's no longer valid and important to do that. Declaration of Independence, as you know, man, it was mentioned really three times or four times the name of God. It was in June 17, 1963, that Averton versus Shemp, that Bible reading was outlawed in the public school. They literally said this, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and have been psychologically harmful to children. So we can see here, here the framers have quoted or used 93% of the time the Bible. So how did we get where we're at right here? Here we go. 1962, the courts outlawed prayer in public school. 1963, the courts outlawed Bible reading in the public school. 1965, the courts outlawed the right of a student to bow their head and pray out loud for their food. <laughs> in 1967, courts outlawed a nursery rhyme that didn't even contain the name of God in it. And in 1980, Stone v. Grand outlawed the Ten Commandments being posted in our public school system. Supreme Court said this about the Ten Commandments. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it would be to induce school children to read them. And if they read them, they may meditate upon them and perhaps venerate and obey them. This is not a permissible objective. So you can imagine somewhere along the line, where did we go from here? We forgot to pray for our leaders. They need our prayers. They need divine assistance. You and I make decisions every day. You made a decision to be here today, and I'm so glad, and I know God's glad that you are too. So it's important for us to consider this. I like where James Madison, and I'll end with this, one man's most responsible for the Constitution, James Madison, said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, but upon our political constitutions, upon and of us to govern ourselves by the Ten Commandments. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Well, I sure love America, and I love Americans, and we are still the most generous, the most helpful, the most giving, the most patriotic, and today's that day, isn't it? I want to thank you for joining us today at Hope Chapel, Huntington Beach. It's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at hopechapelhb.org? Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org slash give. If a check is your preferred method, you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel. P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.